wish to thank the organizers of this inaugural annual leadership lecture series for doing me the honor of being your first lecturer and offering me the opportunity of sharing my perspectives and taking stock of current trends in Africa's development. I consider this dialogue an important part of what it takes to go through the institutions of higher learning. A vibrant discourse on problems of society outside the formal curricula of each academic discipline is a sine qua non for university degree from a reputable university such as yours. Such vivacity was the case in my days at Legon when youth at the University of Ghana played vital roles in shaping policies for the country and even for our continent. The fight against apartheid and the liberation of the rest of Africa from the last vestiges of colonialism, for instance, benefited tremendously from youth in universities across the continent at the time. Ghanaian students of my days were no exception. So I'm extremely happy to be here at this university to discuss effortment by giving momentum to the fight against poverty and to make Africa truly rise. Mr. Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, at a time most developed economies are in crisis, a lot of African economies are on the upswing. Since 2010, the McKinsey Global Institute has been convinced, like most multinational agencies, including the Bretton Woods Institution, that the African economies are like, quote, lions on the move, end of quote. Yet the continued failure of commodity prices to recover sufficiently and the global slowdown of economic growth, especially in China and other emerging markets, made 2016 a tumultuous year for many African economies. Indeed, the worst year for average economic growth in the region for over 20 years and this according to a report from Ennis and Young. Compounding these trends, varying dynamics within the continent's biggest economies meant that Nigeria slipped into recession, while South Africa barely lurched forward with anemic 0.2% growth in the third quarter. Looking ahead, only African countries which have diversified their commodities, their economies, focus on energy infrastructure, and promoted industrialization will be best poised to overcome the challenges of sustained economic growth. For now, despite the deterioration in the performance of key economies, the rest of Africa was able to maintain stable GDP growth rates and productivity growth rates over the last five years. Indeed, real GDP grew at an annual rate of 4.4% a year, and productivity grew at a compound rate of 1.7% over the same period. The real challenge for me is the question of how to equip the successor generation, you, the youth of today, to renegotiate Africa's position through building on the phenomena of Africa rising. The trend of globalization has foisted increased interconnectedness on businesses or other organizations to develop international influence or start operating on an international scale. The story of fast-growing African economies as a result of a boom in commodity prices, the development of the manufacturing and service industries, a fast-growing middle class, 
the continent's enthusiasm for technology, as well as more favorable political and security conditions are all too familiar. This results in several African countries being consistently among the world's fastest growing economies. However, while strong growth and an improvement in living conditions for millions of Africans were observed before, during, and after the global financial crisis, conditions deteriorated between 2014 and 2016 and in the early part of this year. Weaker global growth and a slump in commodity prices eroded economic growth in many countries, resulting in rising unemployment. For a purposeful preparation of young Africans to massively deploy and brace up for the advantages as well as the challenges of Africa rising and mobilize themselves to increase trade and cultural exchanges across the globe. What is Africa rising? There's a groundswell of opinion for and against the concept of Africa rising. Whether it is true or not, what cannot be disputed is that Africa has to contend with the competitiveness of globalization. A more integrated world market must be leveraged to open a wide potential for economic growth. Such a situation represents an unparalleled opportunity for African countries to raise their living standards. The notion of African rising itself gained global attention in the first decade of this century. It was coined to describe the rapid economic growth in sub-Saharan Africa and the belief in the inevitability of further rapid development on the continent. Almost all independent economic research organizations agree on this. Over the past decade, six of the world's fastest 10 growing countries have been African. In eight of the past 10 years, Africa's growth has been faster than East Asia, including Japan, even allowing for the knock-on effect of the Northern Hemisphere's slowdown. The IMF expects Africa to continue to grow, some as by as much as mid to high single-digit economic growth and some double-digit till most become middle-income earning nations by 2025. For most researchers, this development has been due largely to improved governance and democratization of African states since the end of the Cold War. Africa's relative peace greater availability of mobile phones and other forms of information technologies has seen the increase in African consumer spending as well as in growth and in entrepreneurship. This may not be disputable because between 2015, between 2005 and 2015, the economy of Africa as a whole increased by 50% in contrast to a world average of 23%. The new crop of leaders on the continent have forged ahead with high strategic development initiatives to ensure that Africa does not remain in the periphery of a global economy by diversifying their respective economies institutionalization of macroeconomic politics that would change the continent from being cash poor and project rich, which has been a consequence of interventions and policies of donor institutions in the past. Projected to be inching towards a combined GDP of 2.6 trillion by 2020, Africa's growth rate is one that has been on the upward trend. In the last two decades, most countries of the continent have posted impressive growth rates, and in some cases, such as in Ethiopia and in Cote d'Ivoire, 
they have stunned pundits with double-digit growth cited by 2025. Some analysts have indicated that these gains in Africa are not equitably shared. For example, the UNDP notes that, and here I quote, on average, the top 20% of earners in Africa have incomes which are more than 10 times greater than those of the bottom 20%, unquote. The unequal distribution of resources, power, and wealth, combined with inequitable social norms, sustain persistent inequalities. The same source has concerns on gender equality also. It notes that, and I quote again, gender inequality costs sub-Saharan Africa on average 95 billion U.S. dollars a year, or 6% of the region's GDP. Such inequities definitely raise fears of social strife and conflict, which could hamper continued and sustained rising of Africa. In the era of globalization, what affects one country may have a ripple effect and reverberate across the globe in split seconds. China, the world's second largest economy, is no longer soaring as it has been doing as India and Japan weaken. Europe is lacking and North America's demand have become limited. In such a situation, will Sub-Saharan Africa stagnate and current prospects deteriorate? I ask this question advisedly because, given unexpected additional problems on the near horizon, will Africa's people be able to realize the kinds of social advances that have appeared to be within their reach? The answer is yes, provided critical steps are taken and ongoing initiatives are consolidated and sustained. This is precisely the rationale behind the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations and the AU Agenda 2063 that put emphasis on prevention and transformation of the continent. That's prevention of conflicts and transformation of the African continent. Some of the factors that are slowing down the pace of African growth are, one, fear of complacency and over-dependence on natural resources, which leads to jobless growth. As earlier stated, until very recently, the nations of sub-Saharan Africa were growing economically at an average of 5% a year, much faster than the rest of the world. A few of them, especially the petroleum and gas producers, have been rising at even higher double-digit rates. But that growth trajectory has now come to a stuttering halt as China's demand for oil, iron ore, copper, chrome, and metallic ore, coltan, and other precious resources has slowed down substantially. Simultaneously, the formerly high prices of commodities have tumbled. So Africans and other exporters of primary goods have suffered a double whammy as mines have been shuttered and pipeline deliveries slowed down. The pace of exploration in West and East African waters has also considerably faltered. This is all the more so concerning as two-thirds of African economies depend on export of a few commodities. A case in point is the Central African countries that are now in deep economic crisis owing to the sharp drop in the oil prices. Sub-Saharan Africa's economic resurgence in this century has been fueled by multiple factors. A number of studies by authoritative institutions such as the UNECA, 
UNFPA, UNDP, the World Bank, and the IMF show that there are significant gains, for instance, in terms of reduction of child mortality, unprecedented access to primary education, literacy, and access to primary health services. Furthermore, democracy is developing and governments are increasingly being held accountable. Africa's relationship with the international community is being redefined. The, continue, the continent has adopted new technologies that are creating new opportunities for business and political accountability. Africa now has a new generation of policymakers, activists, and business leaders. And Pan-African investment funds are becoming a reality. Examples are the Africa Finance Corporation in Lagos, the Blackney Management in London, the Pamozi Investment Holdings of South Africa. The emergence of the middle class is booming goods consumption, and that is translated in the multiplication of supermarkets and increasing imports of goods. However, these positive developments benefit only a small portion of the fast-growing population. Progress seems to have been achieved on the surface only. Indeed, while enrollment in schools is on the rise. The quality of education and the relevance of curricula to the needs of our economy are yet to come through, and the available work as a workforce is yet to be utilized adequately. Hence, the phenomena of the huge unemployment that we witnessed on the continent. According to the 2017 Africa Sustainable Development Report, which tracks progress on the African Union implementation of Agenda 2063 and the SDGs, the reduction of poverty and inequality is very slow, owing to limited decent employment opportunities and weak social insurance mechanisms. Approximately 60% of jobs in Africa are considered vulnerable. Coupled with the lack of social insurance mechanisms, this vulnerability has led to high rates of poverty among the working class. One in three workers live in extreme poverty as of 2015. The most affected portion, of course, are the youth and women. We have up to 32.1% and 35.1% unemployment, respectively. The trend has been observed for almost two decades now and poses a serious challenge to the advancement of the continent. Insecurity and climate change is another factor. In West Africa, for example, I recall that the UN Security Council raised the alarm already in 2003 and 2005 when it described youth unemployment, and I would add underemployment or qualityless employment, as a perennial source of instability, and subsequently called for lasting solutions to the problem of youth unemployment in order to prevent the recruitment of such youth by illegal armed groups. And my own office, the UN Office for West Africa and the Sahel, followed it up with two issue papers in 2005 and 2006, the recommendations of which, unfortunately, have hardly been implemented. Today, a number of African countries are faced with competing priorities as a result of a deteriorated security situation and new challenges that further strain the economy and weaken state capacity to handle the root causes of instability. 
all attention is geared towards addressing agencies rather than adopting a policy of prevention. The security challenges we, we face include one, impact of climate change with its attendant farmer headers, deadly clashes. Two, terrorism and violent extremism. Three, highly disputed elections. Four, piracy and armed robbery at sea. Five, drug and human trafficking as well as trafficking in counterfeit medicines. That's transnational crime. And six, chronic political instability in certain countries such as the DR Congo, the Central African Republic, and Sudan, now in particular, South Sudan. And seven, threats to state unity in some cases. Let me at this juncture dwell on climate change and its impact on security. Climate change, which directly affects the people and their livelihoods, has become a fundamental threat to stability in Africa. So are the major droughts this year in Southern Africa, the Horn Afri of Africa, and the Sahel region south of the Sahara. This is the result of a gradual degradation of the environment. Other significant consequences of climate change is the advancement of the desert and the drying up of sources of life, such as rivers and lakes. A case in point is the Lake Chad, which has lost 90% of its surface water over the past 50 years. So we're not talking over centuries, just over the past 50 years alone. The example of Lake Chad, once the hub of the region's economy, speaks volumes. A quick analysis shows that the regions affected by climate change are also conflict-prone. First, the Lake Chad Basin area and the Sahel, which are transnational crime and terrorism. Second, areas affected by farmer herders deadly clashes. Countries and people face these conflicts at huge cost, namely loss of lives and property and destruction of precious infrastructure such as schools, roads, bridges, etc. Insecurity slows down the gains of the past years as it distracts governments from the implementation of their development plans. Indeed, all the affected countries redirected budgets initially earmarked for development to security. A country like Chad that has so far been able to secure its borders and even help others out is now suffering a serious economic crisis that in turn threatens destabilization not only of the country but of its neighbors. And Niger is now devoting nearly 10% of its GDP to military expenditure at the expense of investing in socioeconomic development. Insecurity also slows down progress in the sense that the elected, that the affected countries need to reconstruct and rehabilitate infrastructure and people, people who have suffered psychological trauma. On a positive note, steps are underway to reverse the impact of climate change by, for instance, recharging the Lake Chad through bringing water in from the river Ubangi, that's in the Congo Basin. The LCBC, that's the Lake Chad Basin Commission, is working on this project in close collaboration with the AU NEPAD, the World Bank, the African Development Bank, and China. Population explosion, which is also a challenge to our sustained growth. If these climatic perils were not sufficient, Sub-Saharan Africa now and for the remainder of this century 
is experiencing a huge demographic explosion. Being the most rapidly growing part of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa's one billion people will surge in the next 50 years to two billion and three billion and reach an estimated 3.7 billion in 2100, right behind Asia's four billion by then. Based on well-regarded UN population division estimates, Nigeria will become the third most populous nation in the world after India and China in that order. Tanzania, now a mere 75 million people, will soar to 340 million and become the fifth largest country that's by population in the world. The Democratic Republic of Congo will hold 212 million and be the eighth largest polity, bigger at that time than Brazil. Population growth per se is, is, is welcome, as it is also a factor of economic growth. In case of Africa so far, it is rather a challenge because the population grows faster than the economy, and countries cannot cope with the increasing demands for basic social services, such as water, sanitation, education, health, etc. Although urbanization is also needed for the transformation of African economies, its rapid pace adds to the stress on the economy, hence the need to manage it properly. For instance, with Lagos and Kinshasa becoming larger and more congested than Cairo and Mexico City, sanitation, fewer roads, serious electricity shortages, and a paucity of jobs is there are a lot now. Overall, cities will mushroom in sub-Saharan Africa, and rural areas will decline from the current 50% of the total to 25% of the population by 2100. There will, I mean, where will the food to feed these new millions come from? How will they be governed? Are current methods of political management adequate to cope with such a population explosion? Most of all, can Africa, like Asia, realize a demographic dividend if educational resources are sparse and new employment possibilities cannot keep pace with population growth. Human capital development. Education is another Achilles heel. Although most Africans have access to primary school, only 70% or so and here, more boys than girls progress into secondary school. Only about 30% of girls finish secondary school. And there are places in sub-Saharan universities, such as yours, for only 6% of eligible students. Slowing fertility rates depend in large part on the education of girls through secondary school. That advantage is happening too slowly, and with faltering economies, may even further diminish. Although the number of enrolled children is on the rise, the quality and the content of education and the curricula leaves much to be desired. To harness the demographic dividend, Africa needs not only a vast educational upsurge, but particularly a rise of technical education or professional education, such as is offered in institutions of higher learning, such as the University of Professional Studies. Good governance. Although much improved, 
governance and leadership in most of sub-Saharan African countries may be insufficiently robust to cope with these and other challenges. Today, all of sub-Saharan Africa struggles to educate and care for its citizens, and critically, to create formal and informal livelihood mechanisms. The middle class is demanding better governance and achieving breakthroughs in some places. But there are many countries on our continent where the rule of law is still uncertain and corruption overwhelming. And those in power or their supporters can often still act with impunity and reign terror on those perceived to be opposed to them. Civic responsibility. The loss of public spiritedness among our youth also contributes to slow down progress in Africa. A number of reasons explain this, including particularly the, devastating, the devastation of education following structural adjustment programs in the mid to the end of the 1980s and the misunderstanding of the democratic transitions of the 1990s. As a result, the respect for the law and institutions began to wane. Rights were emphasized, whereas obligations were forgotten, if not rejected. Schooling was no more a place for learning and was driven more by the lure of material gain. This state of affairs has proved damaging to the cultivation of civic responsibility in the citizenry and the participation of youth in the construction of their countries has suffered from that. African countries must take a number of initiatives for the restoration of civic education, patriotism, Pan-African vision, a love of their country and their continent in African youth. The road ahead is difficult, marred by potholes. However, there is increased awareness and a great deal of political will to tackle these challenges. Some noteworthy initiatives are ongoing at many, in many countries at regional and at continental level. While Africa is clearly on the right track, there is still some way to go. I see five main areas where African countries need to achieve greater progress in order to consolidate their strides on the theme of Africa rising. One, maintaining microeconomic stability and accelerating structural reform. At the continent, as the continent enters the second phase of adjustment, the emphasis must be to maintain economic stability and to reinforce the implementation of structural policies that will make the economies more flexible, encourage diversification through value addition to raw materials and industrialization to reduce their vulnerability to exogenous shocks. These include further reforms in the areas of public enterprise activities, the labor market, and the trade regime. Governments must also ensure that public service, including transportation networks, electricity, water, and telecommunications, but also health services and job skill education are provided in a reliable and cost-efficient fashion. Two, ensuring economic security. Establishing the right framework for economic activity addresses the second requirement of policy, removing the sense of uncertainty that still plagues economic decision-making in most of Africa. The direction and orientation of future policy must be beyond question. This requires the creation of a strong national capacity for policy formulation, implementation, 
and monitoring and evaluation. Moreover, the transparency, predictability, and impartiality of the regulatory, regulatory and legal systems must be guaranteed. This goes well beyond the respect of private property rights and the enforcement of commercial contracts. It also involves the elimination of arbitrariness, special privileges, and ad hoc exemptions, even where these are intended to encourage investment. Three, reforming financial sectors. It has been generally agreed that liberal movements of capital is beneficial to the world economy, also to the African economy. However, rising capital flows place additional burdens on banking regulation and supervision and require more flexible financial structures. This aspect of globalization confronts developing countries with a new challenge to accelerate the development and liberalization of their financial markets and to enhance the ability of their financial institutions to respond to the changing international environment. Much remains to be done regarding to reform and strengthen Africa's financial systems, many of which are weak and poorly managed. Next, achieving good governance. National authorities should spare no efforts to tackle corruption and efficiency and inefficiency and to enhance accountability in government. This means reducing the scope of distortionary rent-seeking activities, eliminating wasteful or unproductive use of public funds, and providing the necessary domestic security. Many African countries will also have to undertake a comprehensive reform of the civil service aimed at reducing its size while enhancing its efficiency. In short, governments must create confidence in their role as a valued and trusted partner of private economic agents. Then partnership with civil society. Final, uh, African governments will need to actively encourage the participation of civil society in the debate on economic policy and to seek the broad support of the population for the adjustments that are needed. To this end, governments will need to pursue a more active information policy, explaining the objectives of policies and soliciting the input of those whom the policies are intended to benefit. Regional integration. With closer economic integration, each country has an interest in ensuring that appropriate policies are followed in its partner country. This could be achieved by coordinating the re relevant national policies within a regional context. Throughout the continent, African governments are coming together to coordinate components of their policies, and virtually all countries are now members of one regional organization or the other. Efficient regional cooperation allows the economies of Africa to overcome the disadvantages of their relatively small sizes and by opening access to larger markets to realize economies of scale. The obligations of membership in some of these organizations also make it easier for each individual country to achieve further progress in regulatory and judicial reforms, as is the case in the safer zone, and also uh, is, as is the case in the ECOWAS cross-border initiatives, and also in SADC, where they've been working for mutual economic infrastructure development. Enhancing the trade links among themselves naturally also strengthens their ability to participate in trade on a global scale and could lead towards further progress 
in the direction of non-discriminatory multilateral trade liberalization. The challenge for the future will be to ensure that these regional organizations are perceived as effective vehicles for the integration of the African countries into the world economy, providing mutual support to their members in their reform efforts. They should not be considered as defensive mechanisms intended to ward off negative aspects of globalization. Some regional objectives should be set in terms of international best practices, and the regional organizations should seek to push through reforms in the area of a legal and regulatory framework, financial sector restructuring, labor and investment code reform, and exchange and trade liberalization to seek to reach international standards as quickly as possible. The pace of progress should be what is feasible, not what is comfortable for the slowest member. However, Looking at the current challenges facing Africa, what I just said Africa should do would be a mere wish list, or rather incantations, if those challenges are not taken care of and with a sense of urgency. Indeed, the nexus between security and development are widely acknowledged and steps are being taken to work in this direction. In 2015, the AU and the UN adopted Agenda 2063 and the Sustainable Development Goals, respectively, in order to ensure a comprehensive and forward-looking approach to these issues. A particular attention is given in this respect to the youth, to the youth of Africa. Also, both agendas are based on two main principles. One, African solutions to African problems, and two, partnership between the AU and the UN, and of course, other friends of Africa. In the same vein, the UN and the World Bank have just published this September, September 17, Pathways for Peace inclusive approaches to preventing violent conflict, which lays the ground for a closer collaboration to deliver at the country level the benefits of development to a wider segment of the population and emphasizes the importance of conflict prevention. It is envisaged that the World Bank and UN country teams will intensify collaboration with countries to implement the SDGs through respective national development plans. Africa's youth represent the future of the continent by establishing programs that focus on the intellectual development and health improvement of young Africans. The continent will make an investment in its future. Africa has true potential for future economic growth, if the continent's nations invest in its young population, providing them with the tools they need to be successful in a global economy. What should Africa do? With 70% of Africa's population under the age of 30, the continent is presented with a greater opportunity and possibly could also be a challenge if the opportunities are not taken advantage of. Young Africans today are taking actions that not only have an immediate impact, but will also determine the future of the continent for decades to come. Africa is not short of programs, projects, policies. What needs to be done is already known. What is lacking is implementation timely and effective implementation of policies and programs. When one talks of Africa rising, what comes to mind first is economy, finance, development. 
Now, a number of studies show that young Africans get involved also these days in transnational organized crime and terrorist activities or are victims of criminal networks themselves out of despair. Therefore, the question to be answered is what kind of youth does Africa need to get out of the woods? We want youth that is dynamic, educated, proud of their countries and continent and happy to stay at home and respectful of the laws of the land. To this end, a lot needs to be done to offer the needful and also sanitize those who find themselves in the mode to want to cut corners or simply want to get rich quickly by any means. The African youth is drastically changing roles as opportunities are subsumed in the changing dynamics of economies, so are the challenges, especially of employability and entrepreneurship. The strength of any society is within the strength and resolve of its youth. What investments are young people making in our continent today, and how are our leaders mainstreaming them into the governance and administrative structure to negotiate continued prosperity for their generation and future generations. Regarding equipping the youth to renegotiate Africa, with the fourth industrial revolution upon us and the rate at which technology is advancing, it is crucial that we have sufficiently educated and skilled workforce to be able to drive Africa in the right direction. There's currently a mismatch between industry demands and curricula of educational institutions. Educational institutions need to update their curricula to align with the direction in which the world and Africa are going. If we ignore this, our young people will have irrelevant qualifications that the continent will be unable to benefit from. We need to give relevant education to empower and equip African youth to be in a position to renegotiate a better spot for Africa in the global world. Local solutions must also be sought for local challenges. For this to happen, we need to encourage and cultivate innovation among our youth. It is encouraging to know that there are pockets of this already taking place across the continent, where we can see uptake and use of locally designed technology. Most of these need to happen across the board, covering the different sectors of our economies, as Africa still lags behind the rest of the world when it comes to introducing innovative technology. Human development is about creating opportunities and building people's ability to innovate and be entrepreneurial. Significant investment needs to go towards this. With the growth of the continent, it only makes sense for us to industrialize in order to be less reliant on importing products for consumption from outside the continent. And to industrialize, the youth must be equipped with the necessary job skills and technology know-how to drive the process. The youth themselves must intentionally create a culture that encourages the building and shaping of the Africa that we want. The change they want begins with them coming together and developing their own culture and value systems for thinking, planning, implementation, accountability, integrity, and collaboration. It is up to Africans youth to step up to the plate and change or reshape the narrative of our continent. If countries are to succeed in achieving the SDGs, 
leaving no one behind along the way, governments must seek out an active and substantive engagement of young women and men from diverse backgrounds in national level planning, implementation, and monitoring. The overall success of the SDGs depend on youth engagement because young people, as I've said before, critical thinkers, part of being young involves making sense of personal experiences and asking questions about the world around you. Youth have the capacity to identify and challenge existing power structures and barriers to change and to expose contradictions and biases. Change makers. Young people also have the power to act and mobilize others. Youth activism is on the rise the world over, bolstered by broader connectivity and access to social media. Although we know there can be uh, some negative tendencies there also. Innovators. Young people have displayed remarkable talent and skill in developing and exposing African culture to the film and music industries with far-reaching influence. Today, Nollywood is the world's second largest cinematographic power in terms of the number of films since 2009, with a regular audience of an estimated 150 million viewers. Also growing in the industry is Ghana and Kenya, among others. Additionally, the African fashion industry is successfully promoting and cultivating African and African-inspired designs and talents on the continental and world stage. Communicators, outside the international development sector, too few people are aware that world leaders have come to a historic far-reaching agreement to eradicate poverty by 2030. Young people can be partners in communicating this Agenda 2030 and the AU Agenda 2063 to their peers and communities at the local level as well as across countries and regions. Leaders, when young people are empowered with the knowledge of their rights and supported to develop leadership skills, they can drive change in their communities and in their countries. Youth-led organizations and networks in particular should be supported and strengthened because they contribute to the development of civic responsibility and leadership skills among young people, especially marginalized youth. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, in addition, the youth should take an active part in addressing international issues having to do with arms, trade treaty, migration, mediation, to name a few, in their respective roles as students and student leaders, workers, or volunteers. These issues are not esoteric. They have a link to peace and security, a key condition for attaining sustainable development and creating prosperity for all. In conclusion, I would like to underline that the main issue is not whether Africa is rising or not. What matters is to realize that no matter how much progress has been made, there's still the need to improve and sustain it build upon the achievements and to address the many aspirations of the young who form the bulk of the African population. Again, it is an effort which can only be done collaboratively with all stakeholders pulling together. There is the need to avoid situations where youth resort to violence to address issues or allow their frustrations to be exploited by agitators and those who promote violence instead of dialogue and mediation in the resolution of political and social disputes.
be it at local level, country level, regional or continental level. It won't be long for a democratic Africa to put its youth at the epicenter of its calculations. The youth hold the ace. They bring about the paradigm shift through a combination of thinking, planning, and demonstrating a better capacity than previous effectively implement and execute plans to achieve set targets at national, regional, and continental levels. The moment is now to change the narrative of Africa being a rich country of poor people, with a well-educated, skilled, and modern technology compliant, patriotic, and pan-African oriented youth, Africa will truly emerge. The time is now to build a peaceful, secure, democratic, and prosperous Africa for all, a continent in which no one, no one is left behind. Such is the vision of the UN, the UN Agenda 2030, the vision of the African Union, AU Agenda 2063. Africa is indeed rising.